What if I told you the bridge you drive over today in Newcastle actually has two forgotten ancestors, one Victorian and one Edwardian, both now gone from the skyline, but not from the story. Today, on 55 degrees north, we're digging in to three generations of the Redgift Bridge, how each one solved a problem, why each one eventually failed, and how the 1983 bridge became the workhorse crossing we rely on today. In the mid-1800s, most crossings over the River Tyne were further east, closer to the city centre. That was fine until industry began pushing westwards. Shipyards, factories, rail yards, housing. People in Newcastle and Gateshead needed a more direct link at the western edge of town. Early plans in 1830 and 1859 even talked about a road and rail bridge, but the railway companies weren't having it. So in 1865, a local builder, Richard Kiel, set up the Redgift Bridge and Approaches Company, and by 1866 and 1869, they had parliamentary approval to build a road bridge. Why were the Newcastle Water and Gas Company so keen to invest? Simple, this bridge wasn't just a road, it was going to be a pipeline over the town. Enter Thomas Booch. Yes, that Booch, later known for the Tay Bridge disaster. In 1868, he started building what would become a very unusual bridge for the town. The first Regif Bridge was a wrought iron lattice truss about 743 feet long, sitting on three iron piers sunk deep around 60 feet below high water into the town. It stood about 30 metres above the river, giving plenty of clearance for shipping. But here's the clever bit. The top tubular members doubled as gas mains and the bottom through shaped girders carried water mains. So it was literally a road on top and utility corridor inside. For the 1870s, that was pretty forward thinking. Because it was privately built, he had to pay toll, collected on the Newcastle side. At first, traffic wasn't huge, but as industry on gates and bank picked up, the bridge became properly useful. So what went wrong? By the mid-1880s, engineers started to notice movement in the iron piers. The bridge was relatively light for its height, and the wind bracing wasn't great. In 1885, Extra inclined props had to be added to stop the piers shifting. Then, in 1889, two heavyweights of Victorian engineering, Sir John Fowler and Sir Benjamin Baker, inspected it. They said, it's OK for now, but for now, didn't last long. By the 1890s, the bridge company's own engineer, J.W. Sanderman, said large parts of the end work needed repair or renewal and weight limits had to be brought in. No vehicles over six tonnes, and even that was cautious. The cost to really fix it? Over £22,000, a huge sum back then. So they did what sensible engineers do. They asked, is it cheaper to budge this forever, or just build a new bridge? The answer was, build a new bridge. From 1897, a new steel bridge was built, around and above the old one, so traffic could keep using the crossing. A very neat bit of construction staging for the 19th century. So the first Regif Bridge was innovative, important, but ultimately under strength. A classic Victorian idea that couldn't quite keep up with reality. In August 1901, the second Regif Bridge opened. This was not experimental lightweight iron bridge, this was serious steel. Designed by J. Watt Sanderman and Charles A. Monocreff, the same people who understood the problems of the first bridge, and built by Sir William Arrell and Company, the firm behind the fourth bridge and tower bridge, this one was made to last. And remember the clever construction we mentioned. They actually built a new steel bridge in place around the old one then slid the new span sideways into position using hydraulic jacks. 
moving about 16,000 tonnes of steel just a few feet. Imagine doing that in the 1900s with no modern computers. That's why this bridge was famous amongst engineers. Like its predecessor, it started life as a toll bridge. But in 1928, when the Tyne Bridge opened downstream, toll free, iconic and right in the centre, traffic at the Ridge of Bridge took a hit. By May 1937, Newcastle and Gates of Councils just bought the bridge for £115,000 and scrapped the tools. From then on, Redgift Bridge was a public asset. So why did this one have to go? Because the 20th century traffic got heavier. The bridge was designed before Artex, before modern buses, before big lorries. By the 1960s, engineers were finding cracks in the strinners and cross girders, corrosion made worse by drainage issues, settlement on the gates side, the same problem area as the first bridge, and they started talking about fatigue life, how many stress cycles a piece of steel can take. Repairs in 1964, inspections in 1968, more concern in the 1970s, and finally in 1976 they said, right, vehicles over three tonnes are banned except buses and emergency vehicles. Speed limit, 10 miles per hour. That's basically a bridge on life support. By the late 1970s, it was clear repairing it would probably mean long closure and a lot of money. So just like the first bridge, the second one was replaced in service. A brand new bridge was built alongside it. The 1901 bridge was dismantled after 1983. Today, only the southern abutment survives, which brings us to the bridge we all know today, the 1983 Redgift Bridge. Construction started on the 28th of April 1980, just west of the old one, so traffic could carry on using the 1901 bridge while the new one was built. The design contract went to Mott, Hay and Anderson, and the build was done by Edmund Nuttall Limited. Architects Holford Associates give the piers that fluted vertical look so the bridge didn't just look like a lump of concrete. This time they chose pre-stressed post-tension concrete, very in fashion in the late 20th century, especially after concerns about the steel box girder collapses in the 1970s. The bridge is basically a twin cell concrete box girder. Imagine two big hollow rectangular tubes side by side stitched together to form a wide deck. Total length with approaches about 897 metres, main river span 160 metres, roadway width 15.8 metres, enough for four lanes plus a walkway. And just like the very first bridge, the 1983 bridge still carries utilities, gas in one cell, water and electric in the other, hidden away from vandalism and weather. It was also designed for heavy abnormal loads up to 400 tonnes, so those big industrial moves on Tyneside could still happen. They designed it for a 120 year life, which takes us roughly to the year 2103, as long as it's maintained. So is it perfect? Not quite, no bridge is. Because it sits high and a bit exposed, strong winds over the Tyne can make it risky for high-sided vehicles. You'll have seen the signs, sometimes they close it to lorries or drop speeds. There was even an early incident with a bus in high winds that made them tighten the rules. Now the bridge is over 40 years old, some concrete issues and drainage issues have shown up. Nothing dramatic, but the sort of thing councils have to fix before it becomes a problem. That's the price of having a big concrete structure over a tidal river in the northeast. Water always wins if you ignore it. But overall, the 1983 Redgift Bridge has done exactly what it was built to do. Give Newcastle and Gateshead a western high capacity crossing, take pressure off the Tyne Bridge and Swin Bridge and keep the utilities crossing the river without fuss. And when the other crossings are under repair, like the Tyne Bridge has lay enclosures, Redgift quietly becomes absolutely essential.
when you look at all three bridges together, you see 150 plus years of engineering, learning on one spot on the Tyne. 1871, light, innovative, but too brave. 1901, heavy steel, built for trams and early motors. 1983, concrete, four lanes, designed for the future. Each one fixed the problems of the previous one. Each one reflects the traffic technology and confidence of its area. And together, tell the story of how Newcastle and Gateshead kept growing westward and refused to let the time get in the way. So please leave a comment below on your thoughts on the free Reg of Bridges. Please give the video a massive thumbs up as it really helps the channel grow. And please consider subscribing to 55 Degrees North and hit that bell notification for more videos. A massive thank you for watching and I'll see you next time right here on 55 Degrees North.